everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Suzette, and I am absolutely thrilled to welcome the renowned wildlife ecologist, Dr. Ray Wingrant, who is here to talk all about her new book, Wildlife, Finding My Purpose in an Untamed World. In this personal memoir, Ray explores the ever-shifting relationship between humans, animals, and the earth, and the incredible personal journey she took to becoming a wildlife ecologist. To tell you a little bit more about Ray, she received her PhD in ecology and evolution from Columbia University. She is a research fellow with the National Geographic Society. She also serves on the North Faces Explore Fund Council, and she is a co-host of the renowned NBC show, Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom, Protecting the Wild. All right, so let's get to it. Let's please welcome Dr. Ray Wynn Grant. Hello there. Hi, thank you so much for being here today. We oh, really it's awesome to be it. here with you. And you know, I'm not quite in the wild. I'm actually at my home, but you get a little oh, you get a little taste. I of love the outdoors. it. <laughs> Perfect. I love it. Um, cool. So let's start from the beginning. Um, how did you become interested in wildlife ecology? Gosh, you know, I didn't know that wildlife ecology was for me, right? Like that term was nowhere on my radar. But as a little kid, I grew up in urban spaces. Um, I'm originally from the Bay Area. I love to watch nature shows. And part of it was because my parents were really kind of like against mainstream TV. So for my little brother and I, we could only watch educational stuff. And nature shows were such a hit. I watched them all. I mean, the David Attenboroughs, the Steve Irwins, the, you know, everything on all of those channels. I just ate it up. And I loved it so much. I loved seeing like jungles and savannas and rainforests and oceans that I used to tell my parents, like as a five-year-old, you know, I want to be a nature show host when I grow up. And, you know, I went to kindergarten saying that. And, you know, I ended up like growing up and going to college, you know, saying to my professors, like, what do I have to do to be a nature show host? That's what I want. And it took me a while to realize that I was being introduced not just to nature, but to the science of protecting nature in those shows, right? Like it wasn't like loud and clear. Like they weren't like, today you're going to learn like, you know, carnivore ecology. You know, that wasn't how these shows were presented. It was entertainment for me. Um, so it took me until I was an adult to realize like, oh, wait, I was getting some kind of passive education, you know, some kind of informal education. And it was driving me towards becoming a scientist. Amazing. I love that. And I love that you like were so interested at such a young age. I can only imagine your teacher saying like, what do you want to do when you grow up and being very shocked to, to get that type yeah. of response. I love it. <laughs> um, so you started with this interest from these TV shows and then it, that bloomed to um, this vast world of exploration that you talk about uh, throughout the book. Um, so what were the first steps that you took to get there? Uh, when you were trying to to pursue, um, you know, this path? Yeah, you know, I, gosh, the path was like the windiest, weirdest path ever into my career. But essentially, when I got to college, I went to college in Atlanta, Georgia. And, you know, even as a college student, I had lived my entire life in urban places. And with a family that didn't like recreate in the outdoors, right? Like my family absolutely appreciated nature and the environment, but we didn't like go camping. We didn't visit national parks. You know, we didn't go on hikes, you know, anything like that. Um, like the outdoors was like the backyard, you know? Um, and so when I was in college, you know, again, I said to my advisor, like, well, I want to be a nature show host. Like that's, that's the only thing that I really know in my heart that I'm interested in doing for a career. And my professor was kind of like, gosh, what should you major in to do that? I've never heard of that before. Should you be an actor? Like, should you try theater or, you know? And then like the other idea was journalism. Like I tried out journalism for a little bit to see if that was a good fit. And then finally my professor said, what about environmental science? And at that point I was like, oh wow, like never heard of it. But you know, that sounds like a fit. 
And, you know, within just a couple of months, I realized that environmental science was the fit. Like it was exactly what I had been learning on those television shows. And I realized, like, you know, I, I cannot see a path towards being a nature show host, right? Like there's like no one has sketched that out. David Attenborough never talked about like how he did it, you know, but I realized, I realized there was an academic path to being an environmental scientist, you know, through that I learned about wildlife, you know, biology and conservation. And I realized like, well, you know what, that is even more purposeful because those nature shows showed me how incredible the wilderness is but environmental science is going to help me be a participant in protecting that wilderness and figuring out the science behind its protection. And I, I mean, I felt like the luckiest person in the world because I was like so passionate and, you know, and I was just like, yes, I can do this. And there are pathways into a career in science, you know, so I can follow that path and do it. Um, three years into college, I was still an environmental science student but I was starting to not like it. And I realized like, you know what? I have just been learning about nature, you know, either from a TV screen or a PowerPoint presentation or a textbook, but I've never actually had like a significant, like deep experience in nature and particularly with wild animals, which is what I was studying. So I challenged myself and I looked for a study abroad program. And I just said like, okay, I don't want to quit. So I need to just have this experience. And I found a wildlife conservation study abroad program. And it, you know, I had to like match my scholarship, right? Because I couldn't afford to pay more to study abroad. So I, so I found a lot of them, but then the one that I could actually like afford because my scholarship covered it. Um, was a study abroad program from the School for Field Studies. And it took me to Southern Kenya, living in the bush outside of um, Baseli National Park in Southern Kenya with a group of maybe like 11 or 12 students and Kenyan, like black Kenyan professors who had been studying wildlife, went off to Europe and the United States for their PhDs and came back to Kenya. And it was such an immersive experience. I was immersed in, you know, culture of the area, language, but also actually having the most intense, like, outdoors experience of my life, like basically living outside for, you know, an entire semester and living with zebras and lions and cheetahs and elephants and wildebeest and, you know, all of those amazing East African wild animals. And it was exactly what I needed. It was exactly what I needed to really prove to myself, like, heck yes, like this is where I belong. This is what excites me. And this, this, you know, I can continue this path and really serve the, you know, the world, the planet with my energy by working to protect these wild animals. I love that. And like that, you, it seems like you jumped right in because you were saying you lived in urban spaces. You didn't really have much <laughs> hiking experience. And then you're like, all right, let's just do it. We're going. Uh, that's I jumped right in. I really did. So I have my book here. I just like, yes. it's called Wildlife, Finding My Purpose in an Untamed World. And the first couple of chapters, you know, it's a memoir. So I just kind of wrote about like what I went through. But I have so many, you know, journal entries from that period in my life where I was, you know, this was like the, before Southern Kenya was wired for internet, right? So we were just out there. I would write letters to my parents, you know, it would take a month to get a response. So I wrote in my journal so much and I was able to just put that in the book about like all the ways that I loved the experience and was so challenged by it. So I was, you know, with these 12 other students who kind of grew up in the outdoors and that's why they were in Kenya. And for me, I, you know, I was wearing tennis shoes instead of hiking boots. I had like a regular Jan Sport backpack instead of like a proper backpacking backpack. You know, I had like a regular, like not waterproof sleeping bag, you know, like I was just, you know, when I had gone shopping for the trip with my mom, like we went to thrift stores and got what we thought outdoorsy people like had, but it wasn't gear, you know, like was not proper gear. And you know, so 
being outside was different for me. I mean, I didn't, I had to be taught how to put up a tent. You know, the first hike I, I really write about my very first hike, which was not an intense hike. <laughs> it was not like Kilimanjaro or anything, but I barely made it and almost quit just because just like the thigh muscles that I have developed over time, like didn't exist back then. And I thought to myself, you know, like maybe I don't belong here. Like maybe, you know, maybe I just have to love all of this from a distance. So I was definitely a late bloomer compared to a lot of the people that I have worked with or continue to work with. I had this like late entry into the outdoors and not a lot of mentorship. So there was some like kind of humiliation and a lot of stumbles that were part of that process. Um, but these days I'm really actually appreciative of how I grew up, like in cities, inside. I think it really strengthened me and it's kind of a part of my intersectional identity is being like an urban person, someone who loves big cities, is from big cities, but also spends a lot of my professional time out in nature. Yeah. And what I absolutely love that really comes through so well in the book is like how, even though you said like, you know, it was hard, you wanted to quit, like you didn't. And then it made you a better, you know, scientist in the future. Yeah. So like, I feel like that whole, um, you know, presentation of all these like circuitous things that happened were, like you said, yeah. really actually great in hindsight that you made it through and, and added to your whole your whole experience. It's um, true. You know, I was in so many situations where I couldn't quit, right? Like I think yeah. if if I had had an option to change my mind, yeah. I believe I would have. I think I would, like if it was on the table for me to like end the program, like go back home, I think I would have chosen that. Like there were really? some things yeah. that I was, I was so scared. I was so new. I was yeah. so insecure. Um, but it, it, you know, there's something about like the timing of that, like pre-internet, you know, like disconnected where like leaving just was straight up not an option. Mm -hmm. And it was because of that, that I have ended up in this place. So I'm very appreciative. Um, but I also like, had no choice. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, so you talked honestly in the, in the book a lot about, uh, you know, feelings of imposter syndrome and stuff, but you also mm -hmm. really, um, highlighted a couple of uh, transformative moments where you did have some guidance. Um, in one case, it was a college professor um, that supported you. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, uh, my book, I, you know, the intention of my book was to write about all of my like greatest adventures. I mean, just like crazy adventures, like studying lions and bears and jaguars and lemurs all over the world. But it's also very much a book that details like a self-esteem journey um, and a journey into womanhood. And, you know, yeah, very much like how my intersectional identity has shown up in all of these places. So, you know, I have this example of making it through that semester in Kenya and really like becoming a, a wildlife expert, right? Like becoming someone who was like strong and like had lived in the... African bush, you know, for months. And, you know, I really emerged from that feeling like confident, you know, in this work and myself, maybe for the first time. And yet when I went back to Atlanta, when I went back to college, when I went back to my environmental science department, suddenly like that strength that I had gained kind of fell away when I was back in these classes. I remember in particular taking an environmental policy class and it was a requirement in order to get the degree. And I thought to myself, like, oh, shoot, like, I have always done science. I've been doing science and math. I was just doing wildlife science. You know, it's all been science. But this policy stuff, like, that was intimidating to me. And I went through, you know, and I write about it in my book because the mentor that I had was someone that I really didn't expect to necessarily show up for me. He was, like, a white, privileged man. And he was the environmental policy instructor and I wasn't participating and I was kind of just like always hiding in class. And one day he called me up after class was over and said like, Hey, you know, just so you know, like participation is part of your grade and you never participate. And so you don't have a good grade in this class. So like what's going on? And I felt really uncomfortable. And 
he said like, you know, let's, let's take this conversation to my office. And he really went out on a limb because remember this was like before diversity, equity, inclusion, like was a focus area at universities. And, you know, he sat me down in his office and he said, I hope I'm not overstepping, but my girlfriend's black. And she is doing her PhD in uh, economics. And she's in this economics department and she's the only black person, let alone black woman. And that makes her feel so uncomfortable every day that it impacts her academic performance. And he said, I just noticed that you're the only black person in this class. You're only the only black person in the environmental studies department. Is that at all playing into why you're so quiet and non-participatory in class? And I remember like I, you know, no one had ever spoken to me that way before, certainly not like a white guy who had like authority. And I, you know, it was definitely risky for him to really go there, but he nailed it. That was exactly what was going on with me. And I knew that in my own head, but to have him like see it and recognize it helped me helped me be honest, you know, and he was so solutions oriented, just like any great mentor should be. Um, he said, you know what, well, like, what can we do? What can we do to boost your self-esteem in this class so that you can show up and learn and participate the right way? And I said, well, I don't know anything about environmental policy. And he said, well, then what do you know? Like, what, what do you know that you feel very confident that you are just like set on? And I said, yeah. East African Wildlife Conservation and Ecology. Yeah, that's like a mic drop. That's like a really <laughs> big, awesome achievement to have like be able to like provide that uh, insight. I think so too. At a young age, you know, I was 20, you know, maybe. And he said, great, you know, this class is not covering anything about East African Wildlife Conservation yeah. or the policy behind it. So he said, maybe can you do some research on like the policy side of that? Yeah. And he allowed me to teach two classes and I had to put together like PowerPoint presentations yeah. and do some assign, you know, assign my classmates reading and homework. But Love he had it. me instruct the class for two sessions on what I knew and they wow. didn't know. And yeah. and that was really special just for me. Right. It was not like everyone had a turn doing that. And it was this act of service that was also an act of like equity and some like justice and inclusion. And I really, I, I took a, I really turned a leaf um, in that semester, in that class when it came to imposter syndrome, right? So instead of constantly feeling like everyone else here belongs, I don't know anything, I don't belong. I started realizing like, oh yeah, like I'm an expert in something, maybe not everything, but I do have expertise in something, which means I belong in these spaces. And um, yeah, and I, so I, I just, I capture that in my book because I have had help, I've had this incredible career, again, around the world studying wild animals, but I've had so much help. And some of the help is a conversation with a professor. Some of the help is, you know, an advisor that travels with me. You know, some of the help is just supportive family. You know, all the different ways that I've been mentored and loved and supported through this career has brought me to this place. I absolutely love that. And I mean, just reading about that experience too, it's like you've enriched so many other of your classmates, I'm sure in that moment, have the other side of that perspective of like, wow, this you know, influenced my my life too. So that's really, really cool. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about how some of your like experiences. Mm -hmm. um, so you talk about a number of really interesting experiences where you're illuminating the complexity, the nuance, and this interdependence of humans, animals, and our environment. Um, yeah, you do note, as you kind of mentioned earlier, the you know, a lot of the scientific side is approached kind of from this academic lens mm -hmm. uh, where problems and solutions are are very much looked at potentially as like one one sided like problem plus, you know, here's the solution. That's what the outcome should be. Um, so can you talk a bit about how you approach your work, like understanding that now? 
You know, yeah. So I have done a lot of science and academia, right? So I have four science degrees. I have a bachelor's of science. I have a master's, two master's degrees. I have a PhD. I did a postdoc. I've had research fellowships. Like I've always kind of, my science has always been rooted in the academic space, which means like traditional Western science, right? Like in some prestigious, you know, schools as well, but very traditional, very Western. And what I've kind of realized along the way is that, you know, wildlife conservation is so applied, you know, conservation biology is, is applied. The idea is to figure out how to help animals survive, right? How to like save endangered species from extinction. So it's not just like creating knowledge, but it's like using it. And in that way, there's a lot of on the ground work. And what I've learned or kind of unlearned is that there is no one way to do conservation or one way to to measure success in an ecosystem when we're dealing in with a post-colonial world, um, social injustices across landscapes. I mean, in so many of the places that I've worked, the environment, the landscapes, ecosystems are very rich. Um, often they're healthy and thriving and conservation is going pretty well. But a lot of the human communities aren't that well off. Um, whether this is East Africa, whether this is Central Africa, South America, even the rural Western United States, um, where I've studied bears for the last 15 years, you know, a lot of the human communities are under-resourced. And so I've found that sometimes the biology doesn't always apply, right? Like sometimes it's hard to say like, okay, great, like conservation's working or this species is saved and we've done our job when there is poverty adjacent to that area. And that's not something that they teach in your biology classes, right? Like that's not something that is taught in ecology classes, but the wellness of human communities, in my opinion, is the only way we can have sustainable conservation. Um, in places where folks are doing great, conservation usually does great for a long time. In places where folks are financially insecure, you know, again, the rural Western United States, parts of, you know, the developing world, we cannot just kind of wash our hands of conservation work because people's needs matter so much. And um, I've had some, you know, again, in my book, I talk about some like really intense ways that this like, slapped me in the face, you know, where my training and my privilege and my uh, narrow lens through which I was doing science really just kind of like was confronted with realities of people. And some of these, you know, some of these stories are like kind of exciting. Like the first time I ran into poachers in the field, like with guns who had just killed a giraffe, you know, and that really tragic event became a really celebratory event in a way that I would have never guessed, right? Like poaching is bad. Um, poaching is criminal. And yet at the end of that day, we were celebrating what happened. And that that story is very suspenseful, but it's something that just like, it was life-changing for me and really helped me kind of tap into justice, social justice, the legacy of colonialism and how that really impacts what we're trying to do with wild animals. Yeah, and all the nuance behind why certain things have happened. And uh, it's really, really interesting to read about. Um, all right, let's jump in a little bit to um, your current work as you're co-hosting the nature TV show, um, the NBC show, Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom, Protecting the Wild. So do you feel like this is your dream fulfilled? Like, uh, how do you, you know, Man, what was that it feeling? Is, <laughs> it is wild. I mean, th there are ways that I, I just, I still can't really explain it. So I, yeah, you know, I wrote my memoir and it starts with me being a little kid watching nature shows, watching Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom, which has been on TV since 1963. And you know, and saying like, I want to do that. Like, I want to be a nature show host. And then 
living this, you know, three decades plus of this life, you know, primarily in wildlife science without the cameras, right? Without hosting a show. And I actually turned in the first draft of my book to my editor um, with a very different ending where I was ending on, on like a high note, but certainly not a nature show gig. And I ended up having to call my editor like a couple months later to say like, wait, wait, I like, you'll never guess what happened. I just got a phone call from Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom, the show that I watched as a kid, and they are asking me to be one of the next co-hosts of the show back on NBC. And I didn't, when I tell you, I didn't audition, I didn't apply, like they, I'm sure, had a had a very rigorous selection process, but I don't know what that was. Um, and they found me and chatted with me and really explained that in the history of the show and all nature shows, you know, in this country, it hasn't, they haven't been by scientists, right? By like people with PhD, like anyone, women, like anyone with a PhD in that exact field. And they really wanted to, you know, bring the show into this modern stage where it was less about, you know, kind of sensational, you know, like interactions with wildlife, right? We're not like wrestling animals, but instead, really understanding the science behind the conservation of wild animals while being with them and getting our hands on them, you know, as appropriate. And I had to revise my book <laughs> and I created a, like a new epilogue to the book that is this absolute full circle moment where I say, you know, I dreamed this as a kid and it has just happened. I, one of my lessons though, I have to say just for a lot of folks is that like, it, it took, 30 years. <laughs> right. I was about to say, like, there were, there were a number of steps. Uh, yeah. Happened, like, I mean, so, I think yeah. it wouldn't have been really effective if someone had said to me at like five or six or seven or eight, like, 30 years from now, you'll you, you will your be. Dream. <laughs> you know? Like, I'd be like, forget it. Like, I'm not interested. That's forever. Oh, so amazing. it's been very well, interesting to yeah. have this pivot. And I'm eternally grateful. I love it. Well, thank you for everything you're doing. You are encouraging that next generation of scientists and conservationists. And um, it was truly an honor and a pleasure to speak with you today. Um, so once again, for those watching, uh, Dr. Raywin Grant's new book is called Wild Life, Finding My Purpose in an Untamed World. And you can go ahead and get your copy now. Uh, yay! Thank you so much, Ray. Appreciate it.